So this uh, is a talk not about technique, and but it's about the uh, exposure to X-ray. So historically, in 1895, Rankin was playing in his lab and found out that the cathode was leaving an image on a certain plate he had. And that led to, uh, let's see, how am I advancing these? Uh, and that led to taking this picture. And this picture in 1885 was of his wife's hand. And that created the first X-ray. And that was her ring, her wedding ring on her finger taken with that X-ray. So the, the, entire, the entire exposure to radiation became a problem with the SRS when uh, in the early 2000s, we had lost the president of the uh, SRS, uh, Dr. Dawson. And he was at the meeting in September with, and he was feeling a little hoarse and he died at Christmas. The next, pres next two presidents later uh, was Dr. Mark Asher who developed uh, thyroid cancer and has since died uh, with the complication of that. So I began to, uh, in 2006, to look over a uh, large number of patients. And <clears throat> this led to really looking at the C-arm exposure of surgeons and patients. And we, uh, we began to look at the natural history of thyroid cancer and clearly thyroid cancer began to really elevate after about 50 years old. So this was a, uh, an obvious uh, natural history that we needed to know. So I looked at uh, looking at all the surveys that were out there and we developed a survey and that first was done 2006 and then in 2013. And I, won't take you through how difficult it is to get all this information, but it's also really important how you design the uh, survey. And what we found is we had uh, 620 SRS members, and you can see that the predominant number were males, there were 24 females in that group, which just reflects the, uh, the composite of the uh, members. Looking at the 2006 figures, you can see that the skin cancer makes up a large part, but thyroid made up 3%. And then we tried to get a history of a colon and other, uh, other tumors. So we were, uh, <clears throat> when you, we went through the first study we did not look at cataracts, which would seem to be an obvious question that should be asked. And, uh, but we had 13% that reported a cancer. So again, in the 2013 study, we, had, we became more aware of the fact that melanoma was higher than should be expected. And, uh, we, we are not able to really give data related to breast or leukemia on the basis of these studies. So the next question is, uh, looking at it in the types of cancer, you can see that thyroid comes up in there, but as you go up, you still have this high melanoma and skin cancer. And the question is, does it relate to that, uh, to our x-ray exposure? So out of all of this, I think that cataract question didn't get the right answers for us. So we looked at all of them. We had 61 positive people with, uh, with cataract. And if we look at the cataracts, it actually would have been a predicted amount of about the same. So I can't say that the cataracts are due to radiation, 
and I can't, and the ophthalmologist can't tell me that they can see a different kind of cataract with radiation versus aging. So I have a little, we do still have a problem answering that question. Again, we've had, uh, <clears throat> and we have actually a small number of thyroids. We're really dealing in the deal, we now have four cases of thyroid cancer. And there are different types of those cancers, but there's, there's four of them. And the answer is that, um, that it, it represents a significant increase over what we would expect. In fact, when we look at it all statistically, it's 23 times higher than the natural history. So uh, it's a really important uh, statistic. So what can we do about the radiation? That's really what this lecture or this talk is about. I think one is that you can really make people aware of the problem. And I think we need to learn the science about scatter and leakage of ionized radiation. And this is something that really has to be taught to fellows and residents. And I'm gonna say that because today I've observed two illustrations of it in the form of your uh, lab. In the lab today, I noticed that the first, first lab had about 35 exposures to, to the x-ray. The second lab had over 65 exposures. The resident, the, the fellow who was with the second demonstration didn't have a thyroid shield on and neither did they have glasses. So when we look at this, I, I wanna really try to leave with the youngest doctors these things. You must understand that measurements are very hard and confusing to look at. There is, with every measurement, there's an international and there's a US measurement. So if you look at the Sliever uh, International, a rem is one hundredth of a sievert. So then you have to really look at all the literature and try to compare them and, and make and get the impact of what's going on. And um, yeah, next thing is to learn how the machine works. The machine actually emits from the lowest portion of the CV of the of your of your unit. So here is a GE regular C arm and the emitter is at the bottom. The next thing up is the collimator. The collimator is like the old F-stop on a camera. It can be adjusted up and down. And the top portion is where you're going to gather your image. So just understanding that really helps uh, advance this uh, thinking here because this x-ray shows you that scatter is going in every direction but it does go even higher down below it bounces off in every direction and that's what you're really dealing with leakage leakage of ionized radiation is really very little the biggest problem is scatter. And so when you look at this further, you can see that this would be perhaps the worst uh, situation that you could get into as far as where you're standing. And, P I, and today, one of the views was this view taken directly at Dr. Hart because when they swung the, X the C arm toward him, he is receiving that the maximum of that scatter. So I think that again, this becomes really important. The second thing I want to tell you is this measurement. The measurement goes out, dropping off very quickly until you get to about six feet or two meters away. So if you're taking your exams, you gotta tell people that's where you, you have to stand. You have to stand 
basically six feet away from the machine in order to drop down that scatter. And, uh, and these are pretty illustrative things. Now, there is a certain amount of background radiation that we're all subjected to. And you get one millivert of uh, radiation just by living in Denver for two days or on a coast to coast airplane ride. So you can begin to add up where you're getting this background radiation. And I thought this is an excellent uh, reference for everybody. It was written in 2005 by Dr. Gordon Singer. And in this, he really wrote that the average, the average X-ray, and we've come down here to about the 10th line here, the chest X-ray exposes the patient to 25 millirems. A hip X-ray is 500. A regular C-arm exposure to a patient, 1,200 to 400 millirems per minute depending on whether you're using the extremity or the trunk. The other thing that's not mentioned there is that if you take a lateral, you're almost two and a half times more subjected to radiation than you are with an AP. So if you took a young girl, you take a lateral C-arm view, you're radiating her ovaries to the extent of about 1200 radiation, 1200 mini rim. So this is a nice reference article that came out in 2005. Finally, wearing a shield is absolute. And I, and I was a little disappointed to see that a fellow in our own clinic today did not wear one. And he was subjected to almost 60 shots of radiation. And that the glasses were not worn. Uh, and I think if we're going to join this generation, we've got to really bring up both of these in a real way. And, the, uh, and then remember that radiation risks can be, you know, the shield, a, 20, a 0.25 millimeter lead ground reduces 90% of the radiation. A thyroid shield will reduce the radiation exposure of the thyroid by 90%. So, I think that those numbers are speak for themselves. And there's a picture of uh, of uh, about five years ago, and uh, I think when you look at the ancient literature, you got to remember that people didn't wear any kind of thyroid shield, and a lot of these were pediatricians who were holding little limbs, and they were the X-ray machines were were not very shielded. And it was really a lot of uh, radiation to them. So I like the idea they're wearing the shields, but I like more if they were wearing their uh, wearing their glasses. Can we change the behavior? Even here at Harborview Hospital, they use three lateral exposures per pedicle screw, and that's been part of the teaching program. And that's something that I object to and something that I think we need to change. I don't know that live C-arm video is necessary, but it often is used. And then we have the question of how much post-operative uh, exposure is necessary to recheck the screws we put in, especially if there's no neurologic uh, change. And so, I think that we're left with things that we can uh, think about because radiation reduction technology is another whole field. Do we need a larger, broader exposure in order to find our target? And then can we reduce the target down to a very small amount? If we can do that, we can reduce the radiation. So I think that understanding the columnator and understanding what kind of narrowness of the beam we can make. I think there is room for some radiation uh, reduction just from the technical side of things. And I think we should really investigate that and follow it carefully. Remember that an open beam can be controlled if you request it. 
you can get a narrower beam through your collimator. And you need to really have a good technician who works with this, understands the problem, and uh, they need to understand what you want. And I think that you ought to let your internist or your PCP, this is a surgeon's internist, know that you are at an increased risk for melanoma, cataracts, and thyroid disease. And I want you to know that the annual clinical exam after 35 is a pretty important thing. Only 40% of 1.5 millimeter centimeter lesions can be palpated in the thyroid. So it's really important to maybe suggest that you get an ultrasound exam. And ultrasound exams are confusing about the thyroid because there are cystic changes that are hard to interpret, but you, would, uh, you don't wanna miss a thyroid lesion. And so uh, I think the decision to change must be owned by the surgeon who's obligated to protect the patients and the operating room personnel. Thank you. Any questions? That's a great talk, uh, Ted, and a very compelling uh, issue. And I, I think one that we've largely either ignored or just not uh, considered. Um, and uh, certainly, I think, uh, well, I, I have I have three colleagues that have passed away from some form of cancer at an early age. I don't know if that would be the right number. Um, but, uh, and, and then another very young colleague who's really just recently been treated for thyroid cancer. So um, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, again, image guidance as opposed to fluoroscopic, uh, uh, fluoroscopic guidance? Uh, do you think that's uh, gonna make this issue, do you think it eliminates the issue, reduces the issue? What are your thoughts? Well, I think you're asking the question about navigation. Yes. And, uh, and so the navigating requires a uh, C-arm preoperatively in order to guide you. But I think overall that those numbers are going to be much less than the uh, often use of C-arm in the operating room. So I'm, I'm hopeful, but I don't have the data yet on that. And if someone has that, I'd be very yeah. interested in gathering. Bob, can I, can I add to that? I, we, we have been looking at the data in that exactly. And an OM spin, uh, depending on the size of the patient and the degree of um, uh, high dose or high definition versus low definition is, is roughly about 22 milligray. So uh, you may run two O-arm spins uh, and you're, you're exceeding 40 milligray. Uh, now that's significantly less radiation to the operating room staff, uh, but uh, increased radiation to the patient. A fluoroscopic, uh, let's say minimally invasive lateral uh, in a body is roughly in the order of 10 to, 10 to 12 milligray. So there's a trade-off between the operating room personnel and the patient. Uh, but to echo your words, uh, there's a variety of things that, like you said, collimation, pulse frequency, uh, low dose is definitely something that's uh, available on both the GE and the Philips machines. Uh, in fact, on Philips, you can get it down to quarter dose. Uh, the collimation is a big deal. And just standing a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a step away or two uh, exponentially decreases your radiation. So, so we're looking at that. That's a multi-center trial at the moment to, to assess MIS, um, fluoroscopic versus navigation, and find what the sweet spot is. But the, the patient sustains significantly more radiation, although it's only once or twice, depending on the number of cases. You as a surgeon are going to sustain a lifetime of this radiation. Well, I certainly appreciate your comments, and uh, perhaps you should have been giving this lecture. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but I have, uh, I really appreciate hearing surgeons get involved in the thinking and they, they must own that decision. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? I don't see the chat box, but any questions?
questions? I, I, this is Vince. My video isn't working. I see in the chat box someone asked uh, for all the uh, participants to weigh in on additional protection and list some things. And I, I will say I wear lead lead gloves. They attenuate it, but they don't. And I don't know that my hands are in there very often, but uh, anytime there may be floor on a case, I just uh, double glove and the outer gloves that thick uh, lead glove. My uh, my investigation has not involved the hands very much, although the first x-ray ever taken was of the hand. Um, but I have, uh, I'd be interested in, uh, in looking at that literature more. Uh, my project really began with thyroid. It's now uh, extended out to these, uh, to the melanomas and the other, other problems. There's been many questions asked about lymphomas uh, and I don't have that data yet. And uh, I really think that the SRS, which represents certainly one of the largest uh, orthopedic or largest uh, spine group, should probably have an annual, an annual physical uh, survey so that we could really learn really what's going on with the surgeons and their careers. And I think it's an excellent place to get a, a real baseline. But uh, <clears throat> I haven't uh, secured that, uh, that kind of enthusiasm yet. That's a great idea. We could, we could submit our radiation badge data. We could submit our caseload, what we do. That is an excellent idea. Yeah. And I'd like to do it both within, you know, the, orth the SRS is now pretty open to neurosurgery orthopedics. And I think that uh, we could get a uh, we could get an excellent uh, database for that. Yeah, yeah I think there's Any a lot of questions? work. Yeah, a lot of work that should be done, and uh, hopefully will be done in this area. 